DreamHack Open is brought to you by Corsair, Monster Energy, Esport Management, and GG Bet. Several teams have been sent home, but they've all done it for a great sacrifice and a great purpose. One Brazilian team guaranteed to make it into the grand finals as we kick off day three of DreamHack Open Rio 2019, and it's gonna be another banger. The Brazilians in a brawl as we see who's going to be moving on into the grand finals to face off against the European opponents that will be decided later on today. I am your host, Bach. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I do want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Monster Energy, Corsair, Esports Management, and of course, GG Bet. Also want to thank the two wonderful people to my left who have been joining me all weekend long. I've got Potter and I've got Dust to break down everything that we're seeing on stream as the event goes through. It's been... Uh, it's been a, a wonderful event thus far, and we've had quite a few matches. This one should be quite interesting. Uh, we'll get into that in just a bit, though, as we've got the Brazilians on stage. What are your impressions so far of the event, Dust? Man, it's great. I mean, I think we got the best teams we could ask for in this playoffs as well. I mean, it took a little bit longer for some of them to get here than we anticipated. You know, Fury kind of losing that game to INTZ in that best of one, but they still managed to get here. Same with Valiant on the other side, who had a bit of a trouble with Sharks before finally making the playoffs. So I think we got the four best teams. That's always a great story whenever we're going into a playoffs. We definitely have. And yesterday we saw some quick matches, some blowouts here and there. So hopefully today is a little bit more competitive and we get some more excitement going. That's the interesting thing. You know, if we take a look at like some of the replays coming into day one we were you know close games back and forth battles over and over again it was duels after uh, teams going back and forth of rounds uh, it was a little bit more of a volley and then yesterday it was kind of like a, a bashing from some of those games uh, we had three or four best of threes excuse me all 2-0 yeah, it's one of those things where that was like one of the fastest day twos we probably ever had in the DreamHack Open. Not only the all two O's, but many of the maps were very one-sided. And I felt like day two was a message from the teams that struggled on day one to kind of say, no, like this is who we really are. You know, Furia, they may have slipped up against INTC in the best one, but then they came back with a vengeance to make their way over here to the playoffs on home soil. And for Valiant, it was very much the same story. They always had to be the number one seed out of Group B, given kind of, you know, all the teams that were sitting over there. Yet they lost the Sharks on train on the first day, and they all had to make their climb back in. So uh, it was good to see those teams kind of rise up and get the form that we expect from them because hopefully that means they're going to be able to bring that same level to the playoffs, which means we should have some much better games. For sure, and we just saw some clips from Abel J of Furia. Man, if he plays anything like he was playing yesterday, just crisp, clean aim, we're going to have we're going to have some exciting matches, Dust. Yeah, certainly. I mean, he, he is one of the guys on the team that usually is a little bit more quiet, yet he had some really, really big impact plays, and so that bodes well as they're going up against their rivals over at Sharks, and there's a lot of history there, so we're going to talk about that, of course. And then Avangar versus Valiant, so on the EU side of things, they have a lot of history between themselves as well, right there next to each other in international rankings at 15 and 16, so they're kind of fighting for their chance to move up the totem pole. I mean, that, that history, too, between the two Brazilian sides, that's history that is now being made present. It's not just past, because coming into this event, we uh, heard that there were some words spoken by Sharks regarding Furia, saying that maybe that team was a little bit overrated. Yeah, I, I, it's hard for me to know the exact messaging behind that, because obviously it's in Portuguese, and I'm kind of just hearing from other people what their interpretation was. So it, it sounded a lot like they just felt like they were being underrated. They felt like they had performed pretty well at some of the lands they were at at the end of last year, that they had been performing well within Brazil. And while they understand that Furia, you know, is a successful team, they feel like they're just as successful, if not more so, on the offline environment. They felt like they could really take it to Furia and be able to beat them. They didn't feel like they were really the underdogs coming into the game. Whereas if you're looking as an outsider, you've seen all the six Furias had in the Americas region, and, and and what they accomplished at the minor and the major, and you think they should be coming in as the favorite, but Sharks don't feel that way. It was it was a little bit of like a shots fired moment, but at the same point in time, like you said, it, it could just be something that got lost in translation, but even still, just to make that claim, given all the success that we've seen Furia had, and the relatively little experience that Sharks has. Like, yeah, Sharks yep. had this international boot camp where they were playing with some of the European teams, and they were doing okay, but it wasn't quite like what we see from Furia. But, you know, it is a region versus region matchup, and generally speaking, when, when 
two teams are from the same region, they are, they do tend to to box each other a little bit more more competitively, and and they seem to be more close in in skill in skill sets. Well, Dustin, I'm told you've got three reasons about this match, and I'm not sure what they are, but I'm excited to see what you've got. Yeah, I have three reasons for you on why this game is going to be an absolute war. And we're going to get to that in just a second, or we're going to do it right now. So here you go. Three reasons why this will be an absolute war. First of all, this is an all-Brazilian brawl on home soil. So you know that the crowd is going to be fired up out there. you got two Brazilian teams playing in their backyard. And we know that those regional matchups, as Christine already noted, can be really big rivalries. You know, there's a lot of mind games going on. There's a lot of familiarity with each other. And it's worth knowing that even though Fury has been very successful lately, it was Sharks who did not them access to EPL last year in a best of five that they won 3-1. And it was basically the same lineups at that point in time. So definitely going to be a lot of history there. Then we go on to reason number two. Furia has definitely been on the rise lately, and they look like a team that's destined for the trophy on home soil. They've done so well ever since the middle of last year, rising up the ranks, coming over to North America, beating up on some of the middle of the pack professional teams and different qualifiers and at the minor and making it to the major and getting a couple of maps there as well. Just one MDL. They look like they're going to be in the pro leagues here pretty soon. And so everything is kind of leading on this positive trajectory, and it feels like the only thing that they're missing is a trophy in their cabinet. That's what they're looking to get here today, so they're certainly going to be fighting hard for it. And then again, you go over to Sharks. They're really hungry to prove themselves. You know, they actually weren't half bad last year. They had a couple of good tournaments in December at PLG and at the EPL finals where they, you know, got some best of threes over some pretty solid teams. So they have already noted, as we talked about earlier, that they don't feel like they're the underdogs in this game. They feel like they can come in here and win this. They feel like they're underrated. And so obviously they're going to be hungry to prove that, yeah, Fury has been doing all these great things, but we're right up there with them. And so with that motivation, I feel like both these teams are going to have that little bit extra to make this game a banger. I feel like that's been the word of the weekend when it comes to these Brazilian games. It's just, it's, it's a banger. And it definitely should be. I mean, we, we were a little a little concerned about Furia's first day performance, they seemed, but I think it comes down to preparation, right? We saw them keep peaking mid without a smoke, without a flash. Maybe they had a game plan and it just didn't fall into category, but on day two, they definitely came out swinging and their preparation definitely showed on day two. Well, Christine, now we're getting into the vetoes and we kind of know what to expect from some of these teams. What map should we realistically see taken off the board pretty quickly. You know, we saw Sharks play two two trains, and we've seen a lot of Mirage from the Brazilian mm -hmm. teams this tournament. Um, I think we're going to see Nuke, actually. Both teams are very confident on Nuke. And Nuke has been sliding its way into the map pool, specifically because we don't have cash anymore. So yep. I really think Nuke is probably going to be a... Here's the weird thing. Both teams hate playing Dust, too, but who will actually ban it? Also, you know, Sharks has not played Overpass since May of last year. That is a mm. long time ago. So they probably want to get rid of Overpass. And yeah, Fury would just stick with the Dust 2 ban. So Sharks are probably pretty happy about that, actually. Fury didn't really gain much by banning D2. Sharks don't want to play it either. Again, Sharks, they should be banning Overpass here. And then, like you said, when it comes to picks, I think Fury has been looking to Nuke all throughout yesterday. So they certainly could look to do it again. Or I think that they could look to attack a weakness of Sharks. That would be my play. They have been really rough on Inferno lately. They've lost five out of the last six games on Inferno, so I would love to see <laughs> Furia pick it. And indeed, they did pick Inferno, so there you have it. Now with Sharks, I would expect them to probably look towards a map like Mirage or something like that. Maybe Train. Train, Train would make a lot of sense, too. Oh, they go for Vertigo. Vertigo! I love it. I love this. First pick I Vertigo. Love this. Wow. Let's go. So I look, am so excited now. So we all love that it's Vertigo because we want to see Vertigo play. But why I like it and what adds that extra little bit of icing on the cake is you are the team that's trying to pull one over on an up-and-coming team. That's exactly how you do it. You pull the wool over their eyes with a pick like that. I love the gutsy call there from Sharks. That is gutsy. It's Especially knowing that the, the interview that Sharks said prior to, they're a little overrated, and now Sharks is really trying to cement themselves and saying, you know what, we're going to be the first team to bust out Vertigo on this land. We're prepared. That's that's a confidence I really like to I see. I also like these second bands, like, you know, Fury respecting Sharks getting rid of mm. Chain, Sharks respecting Fury getting rid of Nuke, as they had just won it a couple of times yesterday. And so Mirage, I think, is a great little final battleground for a map three if each team secures their pick, which I think Fury should have Inferno because, again, Sharks have looked really weak on Inferno lately. Sharks are picking Vertigo, who, who knows what's going to happen there, right? And then so Mirage as, as a third map is, is where I like to see it. Well, we did sit down with the players to talk to them about their journey into the playoffs, and we uh, happened to have a camera handy, so we'll take a look. We lost the first game. It was tough for us. Uh, my boys are pretty young and they felt the pressure. And 
today it's a good day. Uh, we win the both games and to to be in the playoffs in our country is I'm very happy about that. <laughs> At the end of last year we were like playing really good, but in this year we lose almost all the qualifiers here in Brazil, so this tournament means a lot to us. It feels great to play in Brazil because the, the fans here, they are fantastic. They are always screaming and supporting us. The Brazilian crowd are awesome. Every day when I wake up, I thank God to be here and, and do what I love. Oh, this time here he's going to play. I always tell the boys, look at you, look where you are, look at the fans. It's amazing. We need to do our best, our 100% for them, for your family, for everything, for you. It's been a pleasure to be here and the structure is amazing. The place is beautiful, so we are very thankful for the invite and we hope uh, the Brazilian fans uh, cheer for us. You know, I gotta admit, coming into today, I did have a little bit of bias towards Furia. Watching them play a lot in, in the Americas region and North America a lot, and also the fact that they bailed on ESL Pro League as, a, as an invitation was ex uh, extended their way. They said, no, 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 we're already committed to this event and we want to play in front of our home soil. That's so admirable to have that level of dedication because so often you see teams take whatever opportunity they can get and just kind of climb up the ladder. But that vertigo pick, man, I don't know. I'm starting to like swing a little bit towards the shark side. But, and you know, Furia make it so easy to, to really like them. They're such likable so nice. young players and just watching them on the camera pre-match, pre I mean, it's it's really easy to fall uh, become fans of Furia, for sure. Yeah, I feel like Vertigo just throws a spanner in the works for us as analysts because there's really nothing to go off of. I mean, there hasn't been many games of Vertigo, period, and mm -hmm. much less these two teams, right? And I feel like, you know, for all we know, Furia might also be super sick at Vertigo. So even though Sharks is thinking they're pulling one over, like maybe Furia has been secretly practicing Vertigo and feel really confident on it. So, yeah, I mean, it, it also provides the opportunity for us to see things you've never seen before. Like even if you feel like you've been playing this game in scrims a lot, you know, you don't know what someone's come up with in practice, some new boost that we don't know about or some new smoke grenade or flash that's like super sick. So, I mean, how do you how do you handle gimmicks when there's just nothing to go off of? You say, you say some new smoke or flash. They're all new smoke yeah, or flash. Yeah, of course. That's, just, that's the best part. The oh, meta is literally new. evolving in front of our eyes. Yes, and these players, since Valve announced that uh, Vertigo was going to be put into the map pool, they've been practicing it. Not with their team so much. I'm sure it's been pretty difficult to find scrims, but you see these players playing in FPL, playing in rank S, and they're grinding the Vertigo. And, and so we're going to see a lot of innovation from these players. I mean, when, when, a, when a new map comes in, new angles, and you're not familiar with, with the smokes or set pieces, you've got to go, go straight to your mechanical skill sets, right? And so we're going to see explosive exciting multi-kills it's gonna be an exciting exciting match yeah, it's just going to be fun for us to learn. Like, I feel <laughs> like as an analyst, like, I always love to go watch demos and see how people like to play, but there's been nothing there for Vertigo. There's nothing for me to grasp onto. So this is like a learning experience for all of us, and it gives us a little bit of intel on this map. And again, I kind of said this yesterday that, you know, it's important that Vertigo gets played because Valve needs to know what's going on with that map because it needs to get patched up before the next major. So I think that getting that data in the offline environment from events like this is exactly what the community needs. Yeah, I mean, just looking at the map in general, it's one of those maps that's like, when we, when we saw it introduced, everyone was like, uh, Vertigo? And as people started to play with it, they're like, hmm, Vertigo? And now people are like, I kind of like Vertigo. I'm, it's different. Like I'm we still saw very it in that, skeptical. in that video yesterday. I'm still very skeptical. I think the A-bomb site's actually in a pretty good place. It reminds me of a lot of other maps. It's more of a retake site for CTs. It's very difficult for CTs to, you know, have forward position on that map. So it's definitely like kind of a, a T-sided, you know, uh, side of the map, I would say. But mid is very CT-centric, I feel like. There's a lot of easy ways for CTs to kind of overload mid. It's very difficult for Terrace to get mid control early. At least that's what I've seen and, and what I've kind of uh, gleaned from some of the very few online games I was able to watch that, you 
you know, CT is very mid dominated, A is very T dominated, and B is kind of up in the air. It depends on what utility gets used, and if you fall off and die when you try to jump across to throw the incendiary <laughs> on B stairs. I think the, the biggest th worries I have about Vertigo that I want to see how it plays out is I think that the, the B approach for Terrace is really awkward. Like the stairs are not that wide, and it's very high incline, so it can be really awkward in mid to late round situations on how Terrace approach B. And again, I, I do wonder a little bit about middle still. I, I think I, I'm not sure how I feel about that yet. And not only that, Vertigo is 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 a very vertical map, so it is kind of small. The rotations are quick, and as you mentioned, cratering might happen, but. CTs have definitely found a lot of Molotovs to stop these choke points. I mean, the skybox is a little different, so we're going to be seeing a lot of weird nades being thrown, a lot of maybe successful and unsuccessful nades as well. Well, we actually did talk to the players about Vertigo, and we saw the video yesterday, but given that we're actually going to see the map today, I think it's important for us to take a look. We are ready to play this map, but I hope we will not, because I hate it. What can I say about Vertigo? Uh, Vertigo is a mod that really is not done yet. It's amazing. Yeah, I think it's, it's fun. It's inter interesting. I'm pretty positive to Vertigo. Actually, it was weird in the beginning, but we started playing the map, so we kind of like it right now. It's a completely different map than any others. It's like four maps in one map. You have a lot of fights up and down, and it, it's. It's a little bit weird, but you get, you get used to it and it's pretty fun. City site is, on Vertigo is always like retakes. I think they're gonna play a lot of retake, especially towards A, because that's like the site is really hard to defend. There is no way like you can hold angles on A site because tourists always come there pretty fast and you can't even take your position. It's kind of messy, Winston, because it's so close and you can do rotations really fast. Everybody on my team is aggressive, and I think Vertigo is a really good map for aggressive players. So I think we're gonna get, we're gonna be pretty good on it. I never thought that Vertigo would be a competitive map. It's always good to like freshen up the map pool. It makes the game more dynamic. It makes uh, uh, lower teams uh, get a better map map pool. I'm really glad that Valve did this, and I, I think they should do it with uh, more frequency. It's kind of refreshing for Counter-Strike to have one more new map. You know, if you actually look through that whole Talking Head segment, you can see a lot of clips with Knack. And we should have picked up on that yesterday. Knack says, you know, at first it was a little bit weird, but then we started to play it a lot and a lot. And he's basically saying, like, he was a yeah. kind of foreshadowing, like, hey, we've been practicing Vertigo a lot, so clearly they were prepared for this. They definitely were, and I mean, it's nice to see teams taking the step forward and being proactive and, and making sure that they're they're going to be prepared for these new maps. I mean, I think it's really ballsy, but it's, it should pay off because Inferno Sharks is not as, I don't think they're as practiced as, uh, as Fury are on Inferno. So it's going to be really important that they, they have that confidence on Vertigo. Yeah, and we're looking at Sharks here on your screen as we go down the line. This team has been together for actually quite a long time. They've been together since probably as a five around like March of 2018 or so. And they were the team that actually won the first ESL Latin American finals beating Fury in a 3-1 series that got them into the EPL Season 7 Finals, where they actually took a map off of Cloud9. And I think that's where people started to kind of notice them a bit. And then, you know, from there, they've been to, you know, EPL Finals several times. They've won pretty much every ESL season of the Latin American Pro League. And this last EPL Finals over here in December of last year, they actually did beat North in the best of three. And, uh, you know, had a really uh, good games elsewhere also. And then they had the PLG Grand Slam event where they beat Tyloo, they beat Five, probably actually came top four at that event. And since then, it's been a little bit quiet. We haven't really seen them too much on the server when it comes to offline tournaments. They've had a couple of online events they weren't able to qualify for, losing to Daytona to miss out on this last season of EPL, and they weren't able to qualify for da Dallas, losing to W7M. So they've had a couple of rough little bumps here online. They've, they've had some of their maps kind of fall off in the pool, particularly Inferno, like we're going to see a little bit later. But all in all, some of these players can be very talented, and someone like Mac is a huge veteran and leadership figure in Brazil. Absolutely, and players have mentioned prior too that they loved practicing versus Sharks over in Europe because Sharks was a team that was innovative. They brought a lot of strategy to the table, and we saw that on train yesterday. Sorry, they had the day off yesterday, the day before yesterday. On train, 
Redemption POA kept taking that inner bomb side, and it was a little worrisome, but their retake was so strong. And when you see a team on the defensive side where their retake is strong, you know that they're practiced, and they know their roles, and they know their protocols. So that should be beneficial for them. I think another big thing here for Sharks is that I was worried about them coming into this tournament, that some of their players weren't really performing at a consistent level. It was really only Exit who was in and out having really good games. Some of their other players who can't be good, like an RCF, like a JNT, like a Leo Drunky, they were kind of up and down players. They've played so well so far throughout this tournament, and that's a really good sign for them going against their rivals at FURIA. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thing that you, you know, you point out some of these players, but you also look at Knack, right? Like, this is a little bit of a redemption story for Knack. Knack has had his opportunities both in uh, South America and on North American soil as well, and it's never really panned out for him. So to be able to beat Furia, who's a team that's got that up-and-coming opportunity in North America, getting an invitation to the ESL Pro League, if he can beat them in a best of three, that would be kind of like a C, I still got it. I'm still mm. capable of playing at this level. And, it, and it's also important to note that Furia is actually the number two seed coming into this. Yeah, they really like, are. Sharks made it out 2-0. Like you said, Christine, they had yesterday off. Like, you kind of forget because you look at the two teams and you'd be like, well, Furia probably made it through 2-0. No, it was the other way around. Sharks made it through 2-0. So they got to enjoy their company yesterday and do whatever they wanted while Fury was here grinding for their tournament life. Definitely, and hopefully that that day off uh, benefited Sharks more so than hurt them because we, as we saw Fury uh, coming in, they had a little bit of a slow start and yesterday I think absolutely helped them to come into today a little bit more prepared. And Sharks is going to come in a little more cold. They, they haven't been playing yesterday. And so... Uh, We'll see how that, that affects them. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you said Nack's trying to prove that he's still got it and that Sharks are still the best team. And you see Case Strider here focusing in because he realizes that this team needs to continue their positive trajectory. They've been tearing it up online in the Americas region against middle of the pack professional teams from North America and different qualifiers. They just qualify for Dream at Masters Dallas over some of those pro teams. And you know, Case Serato himself has to go up against RCF, who's been playing quite well. And Case Serato needs to continue to be that stable star for Furia because they need to make sure that, you know, the minor and the major, that's signs that they're moving on up in the world. You know, again, I feel like the only thing they've been missing is a trophy in their cabinet to kind of prove that they are rising up the ranks internationally towards the top 15 of the world. And it would be the world to Case Serato, I'm sure, to be able to finally do that. For sure. And I really hope that Case Serato comes in today with a load of confidence because as on the first day, he was a little more tight. He didn't, he wasn't playing very loose. And yesterday, as we saw, he was everywhere, so mobile, and he was really styling on United. And so, yeah, hopefully he comes in today with the same attitude. You guys can go ahead and vote in the chat as well, exclamation point Sharks or exclamation point Furia. And I'm really actually curious where that vote goes, because we saw mm -hmm. a couple of times yesterday where the Brazilian audience got behind the Brazilian team and really gave them a, like a strong push, maybe more so than we expected to see in the vote. But I mean, the odds, I, you know, I'm not necessarily sure that those odds are as proper as I would expect. I see a lot of Furia jerseys in our hotel, in, yeah. the, in the stage. At, there's a lot of Furia fans out here. There is. I think the biggest thing that makes the odds hard on a game like this is Vertigo. Like, who mm. in the hell knows what's <laughs> going to happen there? I mean, I think you can feel really confident about Fury on Inferno so just because, you know, again, Sharks have been really rough on it lately, and, and Fury, I love it. So I think that that's kind of, you know, that's the known value, but Vertigo just kills everything. So what's your prediction based on that, Dusk? What do we got? I think I'm going to go with Furia. Look, I think even if, you know, Vertigo is going to be the curveball that kind of hits them a little bit, I think they'll recover on Mirage in the third match. I think that they have Inferno certainly locked up. I have to agree with Dust here. I mean, we were a little worried about it, but yeah, Furia's foundation, it definitely showed yesterday, and I think they should be okay. I'm also going to go Furia. Even though I think that Vertigo will be a really interesting map, I think that Furia can survive alone on individual pr prowess. Uh, yep. You know, they have a lot of heavy hitters on that team. Abel J and Art were stepping up yesterday in addition to Serato, so... I mean, come on. I mean, here's the thing. We don't know what to expect on Vertigo, but what I can tell you to expect on Inferno is watch out for Art. That dude is all over the place. Mm. He's so aggressive on both sides of the map, always making plays with an op or a rifle. And then Case Serato, he's going to be the rock on B on both sides of the map. What I'm worried about with Sharks is when I watch them play Inferno, they, they, they seem to not even really know how to do apartments control. They almost just kind of hold back alt and just like watch for pushes. They really focus on B. And if that gets shut down, they don't really have any options to go to. And they haven't looked comfy lately. So I expect Inferno to go the way of Fury. And again, Vertigo, who the hell knows? And Mirage may or may not even see it. So we'll leave it at that. I mean, I'm not even concerned about whether we see Mirage, because the only thing that matters to me at this point is that we get to see Vertigo. But we do have our <laughs> casters standing by as we kick off this best of three between the Brazilian teams. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you.